Good evening. This is Mae Brussel. It's K-A-Z-U-F-M in Pacific Grove, California. This is broadcast number 675. It's November the 12th, 1984. This time last year, I was discussing the Grenada coup, the killing of Maurice Bishop by the intelligence community, and also um, detailing the role of Henry Kissinger and Lord Carrington with their influence in Barbados and with the State Department setting up for quite a few years from 1979 until 1983 when Maurice Bishop was murdered. I went into details on the Grenada Mental Hospital, the discrepancy of the bodies. That is still one of the best kept secrets of Grenada. And one of these days it'll come out. The body count came out on the anniversary of the Grenada invasion, the discrepancies about soldiers that were killed, but the mental hospital has yet to be told. I also was talking about Sir Eric Gary a year ago, the head of the Mongoose gang, and said that he would be allowed to participate in elections the following year. Right now, the London Times and New York Times and various papers have articles I'll soon share with you on their fear that Sir Eric Gary will, in fact, come back after they put him in power. I also went into the London connections to Jonestown and uh, Grenada, and there, this time, a year later, there are London and Canadian connections to the murder of Mrs. Gandhi. It seems to be a uh, good headquarters, a place for the assassins to meet, as in Maryland or Virginia, in the United States, the counterpart. The combination of the setting of the hit teams, the uh, mind control of the assassins, or the alleged assassins, whichever it is, and um, London, as I say, in Canada, have a role one year later in the murder of Mrs. Gandhi. So much for last year. There is so much news pouring out this year, that <laughs> this week, that as it's a juggling act to decide what to put on. One of the major stories that I do want to go into is the conflict between the Catholic Church, the bishops of conscience and heart, who are beginning to realize that the Bible is hardly listened to or obeyed in our society today. The military industrial have usurped the power and used the Bible and left a lot of people with oppression and poverty. And just as they had a report on nuclear arms, they have now one on capitalism. They don't have to be deaf, dumb, or blind to see what we call capitalism uh, that the Americans put in in Chile and the Philippines and South Korea and Grenada, Pakistan, Guatemala, and soon Nicaragua. A coup is a coup forever. And if you don't believe it, look at the repressions coming down and the rounding up in Chile years later. Once we put in a democracy against somebody like Salvador Allende, you never can go back to a government where people uh, have choices and can be free. I don't mean never, but it's very seldom. Now, in answer to the bishop's report, there's been a team mostly made up of members of the Knights of Malta, such as William Simon, Alexander Haig, Claire Luce, and the very wealthiest Catholics in the United States that prepared their own paper and produced it in advance of the other one, getting the gun on them and defending their right for capitalism and how great it is for everybody to have the opportunity to make a lot of money. Uh, William Simon is uh, one of the men with that group heading that committee, a Knight of Malta. I recently read an, an article when the Disneyland stock was going to be merged or taken over by Gibson Cards, if they were going to take, and those two companies that worked together. William Simon stood to make around $45 uh, million just on that one transaction, if it happened to come connect properly. He's also on the board of Helionetics with Edward Taylor and Admiral Hayward, uh, clients of Robert Keith Gray, who made untold millions in profits for the corporation the day after the Star Wars speech of Ronald Reagan that was put together by Daniel Graham and William uh, Edward Teller, the father of the hydrogen bomb. The stocks that they were given, and I'll detail some more of that and have before, jumped a tremendous amount. Having your foot in the door of the White House, the National Security Council, the CIA, ups these profits of the new generation of the military industrial millionaires, huge write-offs from uh, General Dynamics, millions and millions of dollars, trips, entertainment. Uh, there has to be some reconciling, and we won't go into it now, the extreme uh, poverty of some people and unemployment and the profit in the hands of so few 
who mostly now are geared into oil or defense industry and making it worse because they conquer the countries and hold on to the resources. This isn't going to be an hour on the economics of capitalism, but the conflict of the people inside the church, the Auschwitz Pope who worked for I.G. Farb and it worked at Auschwitz extermination camp during the war with his very conservative uh, Knights of Malta and his uh, representatives versus the Catholic layman rep uh, speaking for the masses who they see suffering and know that something is wrong. Uh, they haven't pinpointed who their Fuhrer is or where John Paul came from. Once they figure that out, they will then know where the Grace Commission is going with cutting expenses for the government. J. Peter Grace, another Knight of Malta, an extremely wealthy cutting from the poor and continuing the weapons increase. The other story that I do want to continue, I've done part one and two, that I said is the most important um, expose since Watergate and the Kennedy assassination, the Raymond Donovan indictment in New York City, the arrest of the Secretary of Labor while acting as Secretary of Labor. We'll continue those other segments in a week or two. I stopped for the past two weeks and I'm ready to roll on with those. Uh, when I got a call last night with information from a publication, it's about a publication called Cranes, C-R-A-N-E-S, a New York business newspaper. Uh, and I just want to mention this briefly and then, as I say, get back to Donovan next week or the week after. November the 5th, 1984, this came out. That's just two days before the elections, but it wouldn't have made a bit of difference. The Schiavone Construction Company, the one that Raymond Donovan is co-partner with and the whole entire group, there's nine or ten of them under indictment. The Schiavone Construction Company is hiring Pinkerton detectives to assist them in their defense. There's over 100 criminal charges and two of the defendants are wanted for murder. And they've hired Pinkerton. Now, getting on to the Pinkerton story, the head of Pinkerton is a Robert McGuire, M-A-G-U-I-R-E, the former chief of the New York, New York Police Department who resigned in January to take the job at Pinkerton. Now, Donovan case has been under investigation since 1979 when the FBI had the taps on Mr. Moselli and Donovan's name kept coming through there. He got caught with this uh, indictment the day that the statute of limitations ran out. They've been working on it for four years and have been blocked by the FBI the White House, the Justice Department, the New York police stalled at four years. They just got an indictment the very same time it would run off. Uh, the case is being prosecuted by the district attorney in the Bronx who worked for Mr. McGuire. So you have a prosecution in a section of New York City, considered part of New York City as far as the legal work does, whose boss, during the entire case it was stalled, left the city police to work for the defendant of the case, the defendants of the case, a cabinet member, the New York City police linked so much to corruption and red squads, and I don't have to detail all that for you, going back to Lucky Luciano and Murder Incorporated when uh, Mr. Dewey released Lucky Luciano and sent him to Italy to head up the mafia after World War II and divide those profits around the country, uh, importing mafia. But the head of the New York police, Mr. McGuire, is now with the Pinkerton. Uh, he's defending the man whose case was stalled for years with a lot of information, evidence, and murdering of primary witnesses throughout the whole story and hiring Mr. Donovan, as I said, hired the man allegedly who murdered Jimmy Hoffa, who was silent so that the Teamsters would support the Nixon administration, the Reagan administration, and for other reasons, Hoffa was, is an important story. But John Bernard, the Berard, B-E-R-A-R-D, the spokesman for the Schiavone Construction Company, said that they will marshal all the facts in the case. But John Berard also, according to Cranes, works for Robert Keith Gray and Company, the most important public relations office in Washington, D.C. Mr. Gray put on the inaugural ball for Reagan's First inauguration with Mr. Alessio Jelly from fascist Italy and Argentina there. Now, William Casey of the CIA and Paul Axelt are very close to Robert Keith Gray, very, very close. And Casey and Helene von Dahm, 
the von Bolschwing secretary, I call her, the Otto von Bolschwing secretary, and William Clark were pushing that Donovan appointment, even though it could taint the president, even though it's linked to the Hoffa death, even though there's mobsters and known assassins, even though the FBI knew all that and Fred Fielding, the attorney for the White House, knew all that, they pushed the Donovan appointment. So now our Secretary of Labor has hired a uh, detective agency the chief who was the chief of police in New York City. And furthermore, when Donovan was first arrested, and I mentioned this before, he went to court, his current attorney, not his investigator, is William Bittman. Bittman is the attorney involved with black bag jobs, not black bag, but surreptitious funding of the Watergate defendants, and I'll do more in a few weeks on Bittman. His attorney was Bittman, involved with dirty tricks in the White House. Now, when Edwin Wilson was suspected of the role of uh, in hiring assassins or working with two men who killed Orlando Letelier in Washington, D.C., Edwin Wilson working for the CIA, this is in 1977, George Bush was director of the CIA, Edwin Wilson's attorney was William Bittman. This came out in that new book on Edwin Wilson. And uh, E. Howard Hunt's attorney it was Edward Bittman, William Bittman during the Watergate story. So William Bittman covers the E. Howard Hunt, which they use the Mullen Associates uh, offices as their cover Mullen is now the uh, uh, cover, or was until it was leaked, in Hawaii of the Rewald, Ronald Rewald CIA front, and the CIA in Hawaii uses Mullen. Uh, George Bush was uh, director of the CIA. When Letelier was murdered, George Bush was also mentioned and works with and visited Ronald Rewald and the CIA in Hawaii that is now linked to the murder of Mrs. Gandhi and their involvement with CIA uh, activities in the ashrams and with military weapons and drugs in India. The Watergate story has a continuity, and the particular people, as I say, go back to the Kennedy assassination. And now we have, it's 1984, and our uh, Secretary of Labor, Mr. Donovan, will have the Chief of Police working for him, and the public relations firm that represents Chiavone is the Robert Keith Gray. That brings all the power of Paul Axalt and William Casey and the White House and everyone from the intelligence community to the side of Raymond Donovan at a time where all of them know where the bodies are buried. All of them know who's been ordered to be killed in the past, who was killed by conspiracy, and it could be a drub, double, triple blackmail all around. Now, Ronald Reagan's past goes very much to uh, E. Howard Hunt and um, Richard Nixon and the murder of Kennedy. Next week is the anniversary of the murder of John Kennedy, and I'll be doing an hour on the links from the Kennedy assassination to Ronald Reagan today. So I will pick up the Catholic uh, bishops, their confrontation between each other on wealth which becomes fascism or sharing which some equate with religion very important stories but right now i want to uh share with you some more on mrs gandhi part two we did part one and i don't want to break that too far apart i want the continuity here for you on the gandhi story incidentally um there was an article in a paper manhattan incorporated on henry kissinger it says he's in the money it pays to be henry kissinger and it tells how he made approximately $4 million a year. And they say uh, his clients, you know, he has about twenty-five to get 200000 a year. It's, the magazine said he is undoubtedly one of the few management consultants in the world who can command substantial fees for commenting on problems some say he caused and contributed to or failed to stop when he was in office. Now, I think the reason he has these clients isn't to find out where he went wrong in those cases, but to continue to cover up the areas such as the murder of Buto and putting in Zia in Pakistan or the role of him with Lord Peter Carrington in the Central America. I think these clients keep coming back and back because what he's telling them didn't work, and yet they have the necessity to make the story hang in there and work because it's good for business and it's good for the millions that they accrue by the coup d'etats and by the murders, and uh, they'll have a never-ending job paying people off and defending themselves so Carrington and Kissinger can be the middlemen. 
Now, there is one, before I get to Mrs. Gandhi, there's not one, there's two stories I do want to bring up because they're essential to Ronald Reagan and what is happening today in many, many ways. The top of the story is from the Houston Post. It says, Reagan comments, boy, paramilitary leaders. This is October the 28th, 1984. And the idea about it is that when Ronald Reagan praised the freedom fighters down in Central America, fighting, working with the Contras and fighting to overthrow the people who kicked out the Somoza dictatorship, where there was so much uh, wealth in the hands of one family, and he calls the people who want to return to that kind of system freedom fighters. There were several spokesmen that spoke up and said, Ronald Reagan has given us new encouragement. Now, one of them is out, out of Decatur, Alabama, two Alabama men who set up military, paramilitary groups to aid in Central America say the comments by President Reagan will make hesitant would-be freedom fighters come forward because the president has praised them. One is Tom Posey, P-O-S-E-Y, some of you might know the name, director of the North Alabama Civilian Military Assistant Group. And he says other groups will start out up because of Reagan's apparent endorsement of American volunteers in foreign wars. Now, the danger with Soldier of Fortune and with their working with people like John Singlaub from Western Golds and the World Anti-Communist League is that when they run out of foreign work, people in America will get the death squads in this country and they won't hesitate to decide who is American in this country any more than they are deciding who is patriotic or deserves to live across our shores. Shores. Now, the other man who spoke up, even more insidious, who says Reagan gives us encouragement, he becomes their leader, their Fuhrer, is Don Black, a Ku Klux Klan leader serving time for violating the Neutrality Act in Birmingham, Alabama, he spoke about how proud he is that Reagan supported paramilitary groups and it would help him to recruit Klansmen for the brigade that he's going to send to Central America. It should help him. Now, Black is the Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan. He was arrested with others in 1981. They were going to leave for the Dominica Island and they were arrested in New Orleans. But the important thing about the Dominican invasion was that it involved the Nazi Party up in Canada, the Klan in the United States, John Conley in Texas, Robert Vesco floating around Central America, and Nazi flags and Nazi literature. And those are the group I keep talking about that were going to import blacks from Africa and let them loose in the jungles and shoot them for game, like you shoot deer or quail. And they were to set up the headquarters for world Nazism in Central America. And they actually get a press saying with Ronald Reagan's statement that Americans fighting in Central America against communism are within the American tradition. I believe we're going to go full steam ahead, Black said. There will be more Americans inclined to be involved in some way. Now, you can get out the Gestapo. This was one of the most insidious, dangerous things that I talked about at the time, and I cannot believe that these men have taken, well, I do believe it, they have taken the word of the President of the United States as encouragement for further operations to do what the Klan and the Nazis do best, fight what they call anti-communists, and this is where the problem came in England, where the Sikh terrorists were trained by the CIA in Pakistan to fight Mrs. Gandhi and asked for separation on the basis that she coexisted with the Soviet Union and was soft on communism. It, that's why uh, the trouble really was instigated, and we'll do more on that in the CIA. Now, another story which is terribly important to the Gandhi story and all the other information that I've shared to you is the one in the San Francisco Chronicle this morning. The Pope's assailant admits telling a string of lies. Mem Aja has admitted that he has lied over and over again to the investigators. He said he made up the story of Soviet military attache in Iran. He, w he did it, he said, to calculate and influence world opinion, hoping the Western press would pick it up. He hoped to convince the world that the Bulgarians and the Soviet Union were involved. He hoped to convince the world and the prosecutor is splitting it with some Bulgarians and the rest are Nazi and Grey Wolves, the freedom fighters that Mr. Black is talking about that Reagan encouraged. 
It says Aja acknowledged he lied at least 26 factual times during the investigations after he promised he would tell the truth. He w- didn't say anything from uh, May 1981 to 1982. Then he told the prosecutors he would tell the truth. He, he said, you can't really trust me. He said, for someone like me, forming a union with the truth is to say the least arduous. He invented a man named Malenkov, a supposed Bulgarian agent that doesn't exist. He says it was a lie that Mr. Kuzinski got him a false Afghan passport to Bulgaria. And the point about this string of lies is that even though there's lies, just like there were lies, lies, lies with the Warren Commission 20 years ago, the story goes on and still tries to tell you that, that Fidel Castro wanted John Kennedy dead or that Bulgarians of the Soviet Union were shooting at the Pope. They didn't need that, and they didn't want it. Now, the story, the real story of the whole Pope shooting, goes back to the Central Intelligence Agency and Frank Turpel in Rome. He as much as said that to Michael Ledeen, who works with Lizzie O'Jelly, the Nazi fascist, and the Reagan connections at Georgetown Center, to Claire Sterling from Rome with the CIA and Ledeen, pumping this story into the news, to NBC and Marvin Kalb, a television whore, pushing it all these last two years to the nth degree, to Robert Keith Gray, again, whose Task Force 157 and the CIA worked with not only Henry Kissinger, under Kissinger and Admiral Bobby Inman, but and closely associated with Paul Axout and William Casey, but he is the public relations agent for NBC that pushed the Marvin Cow documentary lies, and for the Turkish government that pushed the Paul Bernard, hence CIA links I talked about last week on the air. The secret team that has been referred to many, many times by various writers, identified probably most by me, of anyone in the country, because they won't get to the bottom line, but the secret team is surfacing wherever you see. Gray's name will surface In one story, such as the Donovan defense, it will surface with the people he represents in this uh, pressing of lies with Aja, uh, offering him some uh, solace or to get out or goodness knows what with the various lies he's been spinning over and over again. So the encouragement of Reagan to the Klan and the Nazis that anything anti-communist is green light go ahead and the ball of wax of lies in Rome and the latest Donovan trick of hiring the chief of police from New York City that held up his information from the investigators for years and linked to great are very, very important stories. Now, on the Gandhi assassination, I want to run down some of the evidences of conspiracy for you and just some articles that are very important to the way Mrs. Gandhi not only was murdered, but the way it will be covered up, identical, identical pattern. The recipe is the same for these tricks because Adolf Hitler didn't vary and our State Department and CIA don't vary. And once you've solved these various assassinations, or one in particular, you can look for clues right away. Now, the moment Mrs. Gandhi was murdered, of course, October 31st, the first day's coverage on it, her Sikh guards assassinate Gandhi. Well, that solves. I mean, it's clear. She went into the temple. They shot her. Case closed. Now, a story came out in People's World, October 26, four days before Mrs. Gandhi was murdered by Tom Foley. Reveal CIA dirty tricks in India. Now, this refers to the Rewald Company in Hawaii that I went at length about last week in the assassination and the role of Ronald Reagan working with Rewald in Hawaii and George Bush and Lynn Nofziger and their worldwide relationships and their dirty deals and the Fund of India. But the important point about this story is that this was printed uh, four days, it was out on the press four days before Mrs. Gandhi was killed. And it has to do with the Indian uh, firms that I mentioned last week and the million dollars that went into the CIA for arms and drugs. But she was meeting with people from the State Department, Mr. Murphy, just a week before she was murdered because the Senate intelligence was leaking information that India was going to bomb Pakistan's uh, nuclear plant as an excuse for Pakistan to attack India. 
And the State Department had sent Murphy not to her funeral. He came back a few days later when she was dead. But he was sent to talk over what the American statesmen were saying about Mrs. Gandhi and if there were confrontations between Pakistan and India, the CIA would defend Pakistan. We put Zia in against Buda. We need him for all the narcotics he brings in this country to keep most of the people zonked out. But Mrs. Gandhi's newspaper in India published an article, The Times of India. The, the story says, The respected Times of India last week zeroed in. So that was about 14 days before she was killed. She got word of the role of the intelligence community and what they were doing in India and the Fund of India. And naturally, she's going to respond. Another story from the Washington Times, November the 9th. Mrs. Gandhi feared religious discord. A newspaper article was published after she was murdered, but the interview was done before she was killed. And the magazine said, this is in August, two months before she's murdered. The magazine said she made remarks in a two-day interview in August with an author, Mr. Bose, B-O-S-E, a professor of history at, in Calcutta at the university. And she said that the situation in the Punjab with the Sikhs was, in quote, serious because never before had her country been challenged this way, the integrity of her country, that when she went in to stop the terrorists, she had never been in a position of having to be challenged. And she said this challenge has not come up in Punjab. It is raised in the United States of America. This is Mrs. Gandhi, not the Soviet Union talking. This is in August of 1984. It is raised in the United States. It is raised in Canada. And that's very important because the third man who met with the two assailants uh, was the one who ordered or dictated that they do the shooting. And he left for Canada 12 days before. It's interesting that the international police know so many details and can't find them. And she said it's also raised in West Germany. Well, that's where the BND, the Galen operation, works with RCIA and the whole combine for the assassinations comes out of London, United States, and West Germany. And in this case, she brings in Canada. Now, why would she mention Canada in August of uh, 84? Nobody in Canada from any of the articles I've seen was bothering Mrs. Gandhi, but she said the irritations came from Canada, and there, in fact, are links of the CIA and this uh, fellow who was trained by the CIA in Pakistan and worked with the two assailants going to Canada. So that bothered her in August. Now, Monterey Herald has a story that Jack Anderson did, a syndicated column, on her concern of preserving India. She said that her country... Uh, should come first. It's called India Came First, and to the irritation of the anti-communist zealots in this country, in her country, and the, also the anti-American counterparts in the Kremlin, uh, Mrs. Gandhi refused to let her country become embroiled in the United States-Soviet rivalry. Well, if you refuse to get embroiled in that, you are as good as dead. You're going to be either be with us or dead. The, the fun and games are over, and the hit squads begin to work, and if Another point is that if, say, someone like Maurice Bishop comes to the United States and says, help me, or Mrs. Gandhi came to the United States and said, would you give us weapons too? We say no. So she depends upon the Soviet Union to protect herself against Pakistan. And then the assassins assassins can say, oh, you're pro-Soviet. And she knocked on every door in America. And this article is, is about... Uh, the resentment and the suspicion the Indians had going back to 1971 when the United States favored Pakistan against India, but also trying to deal with Americans and how they wouldn't help her, but force her to go somewhere to protect yourself, which you have to do these days or any other time. And uh, once she's forced there, then the anti-communists come in. And don't blush, just as the anti-communists, the Klan and the Nazis, who are raring to go in Central America, say, oh, the president says we're anti-communists, so he's given us the green light. You can be a freedom fighter, fight against communism any way you want. No questions asked. That seems to way the way we're doing it. We'll take a one-minute break here and then come back with some more on the murder of Indira Gandhi and the role of Pakistan and the CIA.
article I want to share with you comes October the 23rd. Again, another story from the 23rd, this time from the Washington Post. U.S. official holds talks in India on the aid row. There was a big fight about the arms to uh, Pakistan. The United States was sending, and this is the story that Secretary of State Richard Murphy met with Indian officials yesterday. This is seven days before she is murdered to smooth over controversies arising out of an uneasy India-Pakistan triangle with the United States. The Indian government warned tonight that the United States' supply of new types of sophisticated weapons to Pakistan will escalate tension and set off an arms race in the subcontinent. It seems that the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence, with a CIA briefing, had a discussion of the possibility of the Indians making an airstrike against Pakistan. Someone in the CIA told the Senate Intelligence that the Indians would hit the nuclear installation at Cahuta. And according to these reports, this scare within the intelligence community was so great that the intention was to supply weapons to Pakistan to defend themselves against India. And Mrs. Gandhi was furious. Indian officials interpreted the timing of the intelligence leak designed to influence U.S. Congress to provide all the military aid promised to Pakistan, a $3.2 billion five-year package, an increased sale of sophisticated weapons. The sharpest official Indian reaction came over a statement October the 10th, that was 13 days before this, by United States Ambassador to Pakistan, Dean Hinton, you know his name from Central America and various activities, various activities around the world, South America. He assured Pakistan that the United States would come to its aid if it was attacked by India. And they wanted to prote- uh, portray India as the aggressor to justify a Pakistan request for E-2C Hawkeye aircraft. So they made out that India was about to um, uh, considering invading Pakistan creating the situation for the weapons that are going to Pakistan anyway. Now, the reason India is destabilized by the intelligence community is that Mrs. Gandhi would not favor America over the Soviet Union. She wanted to stay neutral. And India is a huge land mass, and we need the bases all around it from one end to the other, to from Asia to the Middle East. And India is just a piece of real estate to be chopped up. Another story, November the 6th, 1984, this was just last week, uh, an investigation of the murder of Mrs. Gandhi is now leading to a new direction. They they are going to, uh, the two men identified as Sikh members of her security guard uh, have given unsubstantiated re, uh, reviews or reports in the newspaper One of them is dead, now one is alive, that there's a high-level military conspiracy behind the assassination, that uh, it was more than just these two, that the gentleman who survived the gunshots, his name is Sat Want, S-A-T-W-A-N-T, and many of them take the last name, S-I-N-G-H. It has religious significance, that's why so many of them have that last name. And he is saying from the hospital that um, there is this high-level security uh, team working that was supposed to protect Mrs. Gandhi that didn't do it. This was the first information that he was ready to talk or able to talk. And, of course, the high-level conspiracy was blocked out by the doctors, and I'll show that with you in a minute. Now, right after the assassination, November the 2nd, the newspapers were filled with stories November 1st, also the New York Times, the L.A. Times, Soviet press steps up hints of involvement in the United States. Now, they were very specific about what they said. They said there's a CIA operation called the BRAM, uh, B-R-H-M, BRAM MAP UTRA, B-A-H, B-R-A-H-M-A-P, U-T-R-A, BRAM PUTRA, that's the name of the CIA formation uh, team, the give all of their operations a title. Their purpose is to foment separatism in India, to encourage the Sikhs, that the Sikhs have close ties to Western intelligence. There are over 100 spies among the extremists that arrested in October after the shootout at the temple. There were Sikh uprisings and terrorists. 
Many were arrested, and they said that they were supervised by the Central Intelligence in Pakistan. And the Soviet Union, after the murder of Mrs. Ghani, said that terrorism in Washington is a policy. It's a state policy around the world. Now, all you have to do is to look at the countries where the CIA has been involved, including the murder of our own president of the United States, John Kennedy. We went through an assassination coup and the lies that followed or the attempted blaming of um, the Soviet Union on uh, their role in trying to kill the Pope. And now Aja is telling how he lied and made up these names. What other conclusions would the Soviet Union have? Uh, coming out with these opinions, and there's a large article on the allegations of the Sikhs being trained in uh, Pakistan under the supervision of the CIA to keep asking and making demands that were impossible for Mrs. Gandhi, particularly with the election coming up. Following that, the New York Times had a long story after the Soviet Union allegations. India investigates plot possibilities. And this is where they identify a man outside of the country uh, who got away a third man. And there's uh, stories about a clean-shaven man who was in the compound there involved with Mrs. Gandhi. They're investigating the people outside of India. And a man named Gianni, G-I-A-N-I, administered the oath for the killing. According to the New York Times, three men vowed in a Sikh shrine in Delhi to kill Mrs. Gandhi, the oath was administered by a man named Gianni, who works with uh, terrorist organizations in New Delhi. The entire conspiracy was directed, according to the assailant who was wounded, by a major general in the Indian Army in the capital of Punjab. And uh, he went on to tell stories of how the conspiracy worked in his accounts of these terrorists. Now, the Satwant, S-A-T-W-A-N-T, Singe, the one who is recovering from the shots. He was shot right after Mrs. Gandhi was killed. He had been in the village home in Punjab of the terrorists and had been with them before he went back and in New Delhi where uh, she was murdered. Many noted here that I.S. Chauhan, C-H-A-U-H-A-N, who's the leader of the Khalistan movement, that's for separatism, K-H-A-L-I-S-T-A-N. The leader of the Khalistan movement lives in London, and Mr. Gianni lives in Canada. And uh, after the raid on the Golden Temple, uh, the Khalistan people, uh, of course, were furious, and the leader in London is giving the directions from there. Evidently, according to the New York Times, there's talk of an invisible foreign hand behind the killing of Mrs. Gandhi. This is, as I say, November the 3rd. A member of her cabinet said, naturally people will believe that the Khalistans are involved. And we believe they got their training in arms from Pakistan. But, of course, a Western dis- diplomat uh, pushed this aside just as people push aside any evidence that there was even a conspiracy in the murder of Kennedy as late as 1984. Another story, the doctor says the suspect in the Gandhi shooting is out of danger. Uh, They're trying to help him. The doctor, as of November the 5th, that's five days later, says he's not yet ready to make a statement. He's already leaked out enough for them to go running and looking in London and Canada for see if these people are connected to Rewald in Hawaii or the CIA or the Canadian branch of Rewald. The doctor spoke to a local reporter about Mr. Singh. That's his last name. They might have heard the suspect make rambling remarks. Those are rambling. And they added that such confessions do not have any legal or forensic value. The fact that two men gunned her down, one was killed and one's alive, and he is trying to explain where the the information and the vow and the person who told him to kill her Uh, where he's located, and he did, in fact, visit uh, the location where these people came from before he went back to New Delhi. The doctor, for some reason or other, passes this off. You can't use what he says. I don't know what kind of confessions or law they have in India, but, you know, even if Lee Harvey Oswald said, I didn't kill anybody, they just kill him and say, yes, you did. Uh, If you confess innocence, you're shot. If you confess you're guilty but somebody hired you, it's not admissible. The doctor went on and said he appears to be under tremendous physical pressure, 
with the pain of the wounds, and he must be under terrific mental pressure following the assassination, which appears to be torn by his religious compulsions. In other words, the CIA training people in Pakistan for separatism to the point of uh, trying to tie up the whole economy and at the point of death, uh, two or three hundred people had been killed telling them um, you know, back and forth that this is the only time and we want it now before, as I say, before the elections. Uh, they call this religious compulsion because um, he belonged to a religious sect that was affiliated with the United States. San Jose Mercury, November the 6th, has a top story. Third Sikh sought in a Gandhi assassination probe. The international police from Paris and elsewhere are looking for a third man. Vital to the murder, he is now thought to be in Canada. A Paris-based police organization wouldn't elaborate on the investigation, but the person who put the assailants under the oath is only known by the name of Gianni. He's believed to have been a follower of Mr. Ben, ben Ranwell. That was the fellow, B-H-I-N-D-R-A-N-W-A-L-E. He's the militant preacher, the terrorist preacher, they called him, who was killed when Mrs. Gandhi stormed into the uh, temple because she believed that he was behind troubles that, as she said, she never had anywhere before that seemed to be coming from the United States and from Canada and Great Britain and West Germany. Uh, she identified the places all right before she was dead. And the article says Gianni was believed headed for Canada, where he is believed to have relatives. It's interesting that they knew that he had relatives or knew that he went to Canada, as if somebody along the way who saw him wouldn't pick him up. This is like Lissio Jelly walking out of the Swiss jail and going down to South America. Everyone knows the details, but no one's supposed to be involved. A, another account about George Shultz going to the funeral. Shultz says the Soviets deny tying the CIA to the assassination. He confronted Soviet Premier T-I-N-H-O-N-O-V, Tin Hanov, and uh, at the time of the funeral, and the Soviet Union agent, well, the premier said, no, we didn't say that the United States killed Mrs. Gandhi. We said that you have state terrorism. Pravda said that the CIA sponsored operations to foment separatism in India, and they quoted an Indian communist paper publication of the allegations, the United States backed the Sikh separatists in the Punjab. So the Soviet Union explained that the United States is uh, backing the terrorists, that Gandhi had maintained cordial ties with the Soviet Union, they were the chief arms supplier, that the United States Indian relations were bad, they were cold, and the Pakistani press had printed information about the relationship of the United States and, again, Dean Hinton and so forth, to the uh, friction between India and um, the United States. So George Shultz went to the funeral uh, with pa in his face, wanting to act as if the Soviet Union were horrendous in suggesting that we are international terrorists. And they just they said, no, we didn't say that you ordered a murder. What we said was that you trained the Sikhs in Pakistan. You trained the uh, Punjab seeks to be terrorists and you encourage them to do it and this is what brought on the confrontation and the modus operandi for her murder the Monterey Herald has a story November the 7th five top officers fired in the wake of the Gandhi murder they removed five of the top ranking police intelligence from their jobs a senior government source says more changes were in the offing more heads are likely to roll the entire Security network will be revamped. The Hindustan Times said that psychotropic drugs were be given to Satwant to draw out details of the crime and that the two generals, Dillon and Kular, and former police commissioner, were interrogated following the first drug-induced confessions. Now, this gets really iffy. Uh, it can work both ways. If you use drugs to... Tell him, find out information about who was involved with him, that's one thing. But if you use the drugs to erase his memory and tell him that there was nobody but him and his buddy, then that's another. And I go back to a simple case in the United States of America when Sirhan Sirhan 
was forced through hypnosis of Dr. Diamond, hired by the Los Angeles Police Department and District Attorney Evel Younger, to tell how he murdered Senator Robert Kennedy in the Ambassador Hotel when it was Thane Caesar from Lockheed, the security guard. And Lockheed is a cover not only for the CIA and assassination fronts, but it's also a cover for Ronald Rewald, the Howard Hughes organization, and Lockheed. They were to give their agents the cover of working for them, and the Nugent Hand Bank did. So it was a paycheck from Lockheed of people often work with assassination teams. So the the drug that they're administering there can block from his mind, just as Candy Jones said when she was given sodium pentothal and hypnosis. They could, She could uh, commit suicide. She could be involved in various CIA activities, and the mind could be erased. So they are using drugs on his mind. Now, uh, the story in Counter Spy that I spoke about last week, June to August 1984, tells about Ronald Rewald's uh, Hawaii office, and it also says that Mr. Welsh, W-A-L-S-C-H, was replaced by Jack Kinshi as CIA chief of station in Honolulu. Under Kinshi, and this is the man who worked for Mullen Incorporated that goes back to William Buckley and Watergate and William Bittman, uh, that's the attorney for Buckley and the entire Watergate group, again, going now going Whitman to, uh, to Edwin Wilson, and then on to Raymond Donovan, the same attorney. Mr. Kinchy another co- had another cover operation that was created called Canadian Far East Trade Corporation. Kinchy was to pay its expenses and phone bills. In the exhibits are copies of the Kinchy checks corresponding to the Canadian's uh, phone bills. It says it was listed in the telephone directory under Canadian Far East Trade Company, CIA agent James T. Edwards, Aka James T. Bishop, and Jack Porter, Aka Thomas Thompson, operated out of Canadian, according to the affidavit. So the, this Rewald company has areas in Canada that I say could be possible because of so many interconnecting links in common to the place in Canada where this suspect fled, the man who ordered the two men for religious purposes, in the Sikh temple to kill Mrs. Gandhi. November the 7th, San Francisco Chronicle. Assassins also hope to kill Gandhi's son, the suspect says. Now he's getting a little better, and Satwant Singh said that he and Bant Singh, the two Sikhs who were responsible uh, uh, on the security force, were uh, supposed to have killed Rajiv Gandhi, now the Prime Minister, if he was with his mother on the morning of the assassination. Now, if this big plot, this international plot from Germany and Canada, wanted to kill both Gandhis, all they had to do was to wait two or three more days before or after her son was away traveling somewhere, Rajiv, but I'm sure he was home plenty of the time. They lived right there on the compound. She was walking to the office I believe that this murder, it happened six days before the elections in America. The John Lennon hit happened December the 8th, just a three weeks before the president is to take in his inauguration for the first time. I believe that the, that the timing of these things is very important and that when the stories broke in India, two weeks in, before the murder of Mrs. Gandhi in the Indian Times about the Hawaii office, the CIA office of Mullen, and an article that mentions Lynn Nofziger and uh, George Bush and Ronald Reagan, I believe that the intelligence community, or Mrs. Gandhi, was very nervous, particularly since the confrontations going back from August to October about the role of the CIA and the terrorism with the Sikhs. And she may have freaked out and realized who told her, advised her of the military group to go in and shoot the Sikh temple, which I say ex- created the excuse for her murder so that she had if her son was there it was okay but if this was a large plot if they really wanted to get them they wouldn't do it two different places necessarily be easier to take two of them on the same day and i wonder if peter ustinoff the british actor was like the umbrella man at dallas that the day that ustinoff came for the appointment with the movie unbeknown i'm not going to say 
Although many, many actors work for the intelligence community more than you ever dream or realize. Uh, let's say he was innocent. I'm sure he was innocent. He was working with Mrs. Gandhi. He's sitting in a room, and she used to walk from her house to where Houston off is, and that is the day they're to shoot. There must have been a day, because it didn't matter whether the sun was there or not. They were going to get rid of Indira Gandhi, and her intelligence and the police there and the papers were linking from August to October to uh, her death, early weeks of October, to the Central Intelligence Agency, to a man who is now President of the United States, Ronald Reagan, who worked and was associated with Ronald Rewald, and to George Bush, former director of the CIA, who's going to be elected vice president of the United States. The timing is such that she had to be killed whether or not her son was there. And it was set up something of that day. They did it. If he was there, okay. If not, okay. But get rid of Mrs. Gandhi. Now, I mentioned that I have a friend on the peninsula, not a good friend, but an acquaintance. And I like her. And uh, uh, I called her. I told mentioned before on the air, her son is in um, over there in India and with the Sikhs. And she's a Sikh. Her husband is. She's from Germany. But she is a American Sikh. I don't know if her husband's Indian, born Indian or not. I don't know. And the minute I called her, I called the day after the assassination on Mrs. Gandhi, the first thing she said to me was, and I think I told you before, the KGB did it. And I said, well, why would they do it? And she said, that's a good question. And I shared that with you last week. Well, Armando Ray Harold had a large story this week, almost a half a page. I've never seen such a big article except maybe when they declare World War III, there's a picture of the head of the Sikhs in this country, the Western Hemisphere, Yogi Bhajan, B-H-A-J-A-N. The writer for the Monterey Herald is Calvin Demon, D-E-M-M-O-N. And this is the big lead thing. Warns of World War III in speech here, the KGB killed Mrs. Gandhi, the Sikh says. Now, he's the head of 250,000 Sikhs in the Western Hemisphere. He came to Monterey, our little Monterey uh, County, with the Presidio War School, the uh, Defense Department Sikhs at Fort Ord, and he talked about prelude to World War III. He said it wasn't the Sikhs. It was the American CIA. It was the KGB who did it, and he's, he's talking at an ashram over by Del Monte Beach and uh, telling the Sikhs from the Monterey community Who killed Indira Gandhi? The Russians. They wanted weaker Rajiv Gandhi, who succeeded his mother. She was trying to relieve the grievances of the Sikhs, but it said the Soviet Union wants to destroy a democracy and create a dictatorship by anarchy. This act kicked the Soviet Union out of all the oceans on either side of India, and the CIA will have firm control. He says the trade grip of Russia on India is very heavy. The textiles, the mango... Vegetables, Indian shoes, and bananas are produced for Russia. Every product of India is being sold in Moscow, and they have the guts to say the CIA did it. Well, if India has no market for things, if Soviet Union is buying them there, and the Soviet Union is exporting, and the CIA is is angry that we are trading back and forth and coexisting, and we want a partner that hates the Soviet Union, uh, there isn't a thing in what he says in this long article, and I'll get back to more of it if we have time. There's a few more I want to go into. But the KGB killed Mrs. Gandhi. This is the prime uh, story uh, that they will try to push. Interestingly enough, the New York Times that same day has a story, Strange Rumors Flare Briefly in New Delhi. And this has to be stories about Mrs. Gandhi. It says that it, the rumors that one senior ga- uh, aide was shot and killed trying to shield her from the bullets of the assassins, but then they said it wasn't true, and people were spreading some disinformation. But it says, uh, according to the Indian radio, few Sikhs have confidence in the government-controlled radio and television networks in India. They listen regularly to British Broadcasting, BBC, and the Voice of America for this information of Indian developments. Well, Voice of America is strictly a CIA operation headed by James Buckley, William Shakespeare, the Intelligence Community for Information, U.S. Information, and set up originally by J. Peter Grace, bringing in the Romanian Iron Guard and Nazis, so that they also, on the day that they're to shoot, could get information from 
Voice of America in a code of any kind or any song that you kill it tomorrow. There's too much information about what's going on with our work with the Sikhs in Pakistan. It's time to eradicate her. Another story, um, killing came at troubled time. This is from the Washington Post. India's facing an era of uncertainty. Now, this was written one day after her death. She was murdered uh, on, well, the 30th late at night, but with the clock difference, it broke on the 31st here in the United States. And this story was written in the Washington Post. How would they know? This is one day later. The body is hardly cold. She's just been killed. The death of Prime Minister Gandhi leaves the world's largest democracy facing a period of prolonged uncertainty with the potential for greater domestic instability with new tensions at his neighbors, particularly Pakistan. And this article says, the it goes on to say, India's main arms supplier, the Soviet Union, had been New Delhi's most constant great power supporter and a principal trading partner since the two nations signed a 20-year friendship treaty in 1971. India has been a major factor in Soviet policies in Asia and beyond serving in the Soviet view as a counterweight to China, as well as Moscow's closest friend in the non-communist world in Moscow. Some diplomats in Moscow say that Washington's role as a principal arms supplier helped push India into a closer relationship with Moscow. India has been able to count on the Soviet Union to support its position on controversial international questions such as conflicting Pakistan and Indian claims in the province of Kashmir. India, in turn, declined to comment on uh, Soviet actions in Afghanistan, Hungary, or Czechoslovakia because the United States has become strong with China and Pakistan and India is squeezed in the middle. And finally, the President of the United States, uh, three days before his election, Ronald Reagan has an interview November the 4th. President Reagan, Reagan campaigning in Iowa, criticized the Soviets for saying the United States was involved in the assassinations. This is his quote. I think it was probably the world's biggest cheap shot in a long, long time. They know better, of course. They have been told we don't like it. I know that human life doesn't mean much to them, he added. But to take advantage of a tragedy of this kind and try and gain some political advantage was a cheap shot. This is a President of the United States saying human life doesn't mean much to them. When the United States could have been embroiled and been taken over by the entire Nazi regime, which had happened to have happened later after the war, but not during the war, where we combined with them after the war, the Soviet Union lost 20 million men defending, men, women, and children defending their form of government. You may like it or leave it, but 20 million Americans haven't died defending our country yet. And 20 million defended, and Ronald Reagan says this is a cheap shot. He says he didn't, they know better. They have been told we don't like it. Well, I don't know if they know better. I mean, they survived and weren't so vocal. When we said Marina, the communist, uh, had a role with Lee Harvey Oswald, the communist, and that her uncle was in the KGB, and Fidel Castro and the communist wanted to kill the president, or the Pope's assailant worked with the communists, the Soviets, and the Bulgarians. This line has to stop. Next week will be the 20th anniversary of the murder of John Kennedy, and I will spend one hour putting together links of Ronald Reagan and this intelligence community that were a part in the murder of that president. And unless the people, just like the Vatican uh, bishops now, get together, unless the people get together and say, wait a minute, we know better. You confront us with your facts, we'll confront you with ours. There won't be any hope in this country. For Ronald Reagan to say they know better when they know what we've done in all those other countries and those dictators that we've put in and the arms we've sent and the rights of the people suppress every Central American country and the school for coups and assassins in Panama, the schools for assassins in the CIA. Ronald Reagan is ridiculous. He's our president, but we have to stop this. Just look, the murder of the witnesses in the Donovan case. Well, time is up. We'll be back next week. I'll be back with you. Uh, the Kennedy assassination and Ronald Reagan and the far right. 
This is Mae Bressel. It's KAZU-FM in Pacific Grove, California.